With just over a week to go until Election Day and polls showing the tightest race imaginable, Kamala Harris is calling Donald Trump a fascist following reports that he expressed admiration for the way Hitler ran his army. Also tonight, all eyes are on Pennsylvania. Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan for the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from the David M. Rubenstein Studio at WETA in Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening, and welcome to Washington Week. Uh, it's fair to say that no recent election uh, in, in America has ever felt this close, and everything matters these days. We're going to talk about uh, our, our current state of play. We're only about 11 days out. Uh, and we're going to talk about the importance of the state of Pennsylvania. We're also going to talk about Donald Trump and the rhetoric around his candidacy. We're going to talk to, if, if we get a little time, we're going to talk about some developing news, uh, apparently an Israeli strike on Iran, uh, retaliation for the previous Iranian strike on Israel, but that is just a breaking story, and we're going to try to talk about that a little bit if we get more information. But joining me to talk about all of this is Ann Applebaum, a staff writer at The Atlantic and author of the new book, Autocracy, Inc., The Dictators Who Want to Run the World. Dan Balls is the chief correspondent at The Washington Post. Dana Bash is CNN's chief political correspondent and the anchor of Inside Politics. She's also the author of a new book, America's Deadly Election, Deadliest Election, The Cautionary Tale of the Most Violent Election in American History. And Jerusalem Demsis is a staff writer at The Atlantic and author of On the Housing Crisis, Land Development Democracy. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Dan, this would have been a great moment for you to just launch a new book, I think, because we're all, I got a, I got a big stack. Yeah, I feel for, I got a big stack for- Who's the one who's going to talk about your big scoop? I got a, uh, we're not talking about okay. that. We're fo I'm focused on you. Okay. You're the thing that, we'll, we'll, we'll it, somehow it will come up. We'll bring it up. I, I imagine it will come up. Let me start by playing a, a very brief clip of, of Kamala Harris uh, uh, this week. Let's listen to this. Do you think Donald Trump is a fascist? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Anne, I want to read something that you just wrote recently. Uh, quote, when he, Trump, suggests that he would target both legal and illegal immigrants or use the military arbitrarily against U.S. citizens, he does so knowing that past dictatorships have used public displays of violence to build popular support. By calling for mass violence, he hints at his admiration for these dictatorships, but also demonstrates disdain for the rule of law and prepares his followers to accept the idea that his regime could, like its predecessors, break the law with impunity. So you're a scholar, among other things, of Soviet communism and authoritarianism generally. Um, what is fascism? So fascism was a movement that was created in the 1930s, and it has, it's hard to define because um, it's really, it, it's, it's more about emotion over reason. Um, it's about creating a leader who says that he embodies the will of the people and that his will is stronger than the rule of law and stronger than the Constitution. Um, it's a movement, typic typically fascist leaders or leaders who use fascist tactics will divide the nation into the real people and the outsiders, immigrants, um, um, you know, foreigners, traitors, seek to, and seek to create a kind of cult of hatred against them in order to build up the sensibility of the, of the, um, you know, of the, of the majority. Right. Um, and, and you've argued that Donald Trump uses fascist language to describe 
America. Is that a fair characterization? He, he, well, he uses... There's some particular words that he's used that have never appeared before in U.S. politics, at least not in mainstream presidential politics. I mean, sometimes during wars, people come mm -hmm. up with dehumanizing names for their enemy. But using the language... He was talking about immigrants poisoning the blood of the nation. I mean, this is... This is you can find it in Hitler's speeches. And that was... When I wrote that article, that's all I did was look for... Look for those quotations. You know, where he talks about vermin. He talks about, um, you know, the the, my, the radical left who are vermin. You know, um, mm -hmm. and this is this is language that is that comes from the 1930s. Actually, it wasn't only Hitler who used it. Um, Mussolini used it. Right. Stalin used it. The right. East German Stasi used it. And it's it's part of that kind of politics. Let me let me just pressure test something that you said with Dan, who is a veteran political correspondent. Uh, I'm not trying to imply anything about the number of years you've been doing it, but it's more than a dozen. More than a say. dozen. More than a dozen. Fair you've enough. covered a lot of races, local, state, and national. Is it fair to say that the language that we see deployed by Donald Trump is language that we really haven't heard in the modern era in American politics? Your memory goes back further than your than your time in journalism, yeah. obviously. Uh, w uh, without question. I don't think... I mean, we have never had a, a candidate for president or a president of the United States who has talked the way Donald Trump talks. Uh, and the remarkable thing is, the more he has talked in that way, uh, the more he has developed a, a, a loyal readership. I mean, one other aspect of fascism is the degree to which it comes from beneath a leader as well as from mm -hmm. the leader. Uh, and I think what we've seen in the creation of Trumpism uh, is a country in which there are followers who accept this as a, as a way to talk about other people and a way to talk about the state of the country. So uh, you're absolutely right. We've never seen anything like this. I have to ask you, and, and, and the rest of the panel as well, um, to what degree are you surprised by this phenomenon? Well, I think... I, I would say... Given I, your experience yeah, in watching no, I, American politics and, and understanding where the guardrails traditionally have I, been. Well, I think at, a, at an early point, we were quite surprised. And today, I don't think people are surprised that what comes out of his mouth at rallies and, and other things. Uh, I, I think the question is, does, does it have an effect on an election at this point? You know, we're 11 days away. Uh, and one of the... Th one of the things I sense when you talk to voters uh, is that there are many voters who hear this, uh, recognize it as kind of outside the norm, uh, but nonetheless are prepared to support him for other reasons, right. uh, which have to do with their sense of who's going to be better for them. Right. Dana. And the thing to keep in mind, just strategically, as we are getting closer and closer to Election Day, is that... Um, even though this is a, an example and a manifestation of what we have seen and heard from Donald Trump in various uh, times for nine years, it is definitely stronger. It's more strident. It's, it's frankly, more disgusting in a, in a lot of ways. And it is intentional because what the Trump campaign is trying to do isn't necessarily persuade those, those swing voters the few who exist still, which the, the Harris campaign is trying to do. They are trying to find low propensity voters who are interested in this kind of rhetoric, who are, um, who, who, uh, are sort of animated by this kind of rhetoric and this kind of point of view, but have always been really disconnected to politics and to voting, to try to find them and say, see, he's your guy. Get off the couch and come vote for him. And I think that there's also, like, a level to which we've kind of forgotten that 2016 was not as remarkable in the rhetoric that Trump was using. I mean, let's look back at the speeches and the kind of things that he was saying. They weren't good, but there's a level to which it's really escalated the kinds of comments that Vance was making about Haitian immigrants in, in Ohio. I mean, I think there's I a mean, level to which it's escalated. He did start in 2015 by warning about Mexican rapists. Totally, I mean, but I just think that there's not an escalation. Totally, I think there's an escalation to what he's actually been talking about this right. time. I, yeah, I think it's amped up considerably. Right, right. I want to note something uh, that Mitch McConnell, the uh, Senate, and, and Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, um, uh, they, they've just condemned Kamala, Kamala Harris for her allegedly extreme rhetoric. She, uh, they, they said in a statement, the Democratic nominee for President of the United States has only fanned the flames beneath 
it's a little bit overwritten if you ask me, uh, <laughs> has only fanned the flames beneath a boiling cauldron of political animus. Her most recent and most reckless invocations of the darkest evil of the 20th century seem to dare it to boil over. I missed the statement that they made about Trump calling America a garbage can. Well, well, there's the, there's the garbage can rhetoric. Wait, remind us, because uh, 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 that no. just came today, I he, think. He, he said that in his latest attempt to be even more um, sort of out of control on his rhetoric, he said that what is happening with illegal immigration, undocumented Im immigrants are making America like a garbage can. Right. And and your point is that we didn't hear that kind of language, generally speaking, in I just think it's gotten amped up. And I, also, I mean, like, when I think about what, what's happening even here with Republicans defending this sort of rhetoric and kind of trying to turn it on on Harris, there's a level of strategy that's going on here, right? They've realized that, especially after the assassination attempts, if they can make it seem like on on both candidates' parts, there are rhetorical flourishes that are being used that are raising the temperature, then they don't have to worry about having to compete on that um, when it comes to election day. Right. Dan, Dan, you, among other things, you watch Mitch McConnell closely, watched him for a long time. Does this strike you as odd that McConnell, who we know doesn't loathes, like... Who loathes Donald Trump. Loathes. If you want to go I with loathes, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll go with loathes Donald Trump. Um, why is he engaging in this kind of, uh, at least what I'm hearing from the panel, is a kind of gaslighting of the public, uh, accusing, uh, accusing Vice President Harris of engaging in extreme rhetoric? Well, I think there are two things to know about uh, Senator McConnell. One is that he deeply dislikes Donald Trump. Uh, and the second is that he is completely protective of the Republican Party, as he would like to see it, and completely uh, focused on doing as well as they could possibly do in the Senate races. And so this is a way to, to bind himself to the, to the broader party, not to offend the Trump wing of it, to try to get the party moving in that direction so that on election day they, you know, they end up with a majority. The, I, I want to just note for the record that he's not a young newbie politician on his way up. I mean, you would think that someone at the, uh, in the twilight of his career um, might warn against the person he obviously in private has said is doing damage to not only the Republican brand, but to the country itself. Well, and there's a new book by Mike Tackett uh, in which he basically says all of these things about Trump. Um, right. but, but in a moment like this, he reverts to I'm a leader of the Republican Party, right. and I'm going to do that. And can I just quickly underscore yeah. what, what Dan just said? Mitch McConnell does not like Donald Trump. But Mitch McConnell is also trying to be strategic, in which he always is every election year, and trying to do whatever he can to help get as many Republican Senate seats. Usually, in the Trump era, that has backfired. But it is a, an example of the larger narrative of the Republican Party that these Republican leaders do not like Donald Trump, but they're still saying things like this because they see him as a means to getting other things that they want politically. Right. And you were going to... No, I was just going to say that it's also, I mean, this is a known strategy to, you know, immediately as soon as Donald Trump says something, I mean, this was what the Wall Street Journal did a few days ago. As soon as he says something outrageous, then the next re reaction is to say, but Harris is just as outrageous, or she's also evil, or Biden is evil. You know, they need to, um, you know, they need to make, it's, it's kind of both sidesism, but it's also, you know, you need to make the other side just as bad. And that's right. a way of, it's also a way of explaining it to yourself. Mm -hmm. right. You know, so why, so we're gonna vote for Donald Trump even though he says he likes Hitler's generals. Um, how do we explain that this is how we do it? Because the other side right. is evil. And that's it's just kind of, that, that's just politics, what we're describing, right? O opportunistic politics, that, that they're going to try to stick onto Harris the things that, the, the, the negative things, the ostensibly negative things that yeah. Trump does. But it's also important to note that, like, on policy, they won a ton. The Supreme Court, when you think about abortion, I mean, sticking by Trump, despite the fact that they have distaste for how he engages in politics, has gotten them a ton of things on taxes um, and, and on policy that they hold really near and dear. So I think it makes a lot of sense from their perspective to continue doing so. Right, right. I, I want to um, uh, switch slightly the topics. I want to play a, a brief clip of Donald Trump talking about January 
6th. But that was a day of love from the standpoint of the millions. It's like hundreds of thousands. So, Dana, you've written a book, an excellent book, America's Deadliest Election. I'm holding it up so people can <laughs> see it at home. The least I can do. Thank it's the you. least we can do is get good books out there. Um, so it's a book about American political violence, a particular example of American political violence, mm -hmm. perhaps the one of the worst. Mm -hmm. um, but but you've studied this very subject mm -hmm. uh, for for a while. Um, and, and based on your study of of, of history. And in this current moment, where do you put, how do you assess the conditions now for wider political violence in the coming days, weeks, and, and months? Give us a, like a, well, a temperature check. I mean, not to be Debbie, Debbie Downer here, but the conditions are ripe for, for, for bad things. This hasn't been happen. s'mores and uh, beach, beach yeah, blanket bingo so far, so don't worry about it being Debbie Downer. It hasn't, but uh, it's true. Uh, in 1872 and then in 1876, which this book is about, it was, it was real violence and it was racial, racially uh, based violence. Give us the 30 second. The 30 second is it was, uh, it was reconstruction after the Civil War and the uh, Southern Democrats were trying to find a way to keep their society the way it was. They didn't have slaves anymore, but they didn't want blacks to have uh, equality. So they realized they could do it at the ballot box because uh, men, black men had the ability to vote. And uh, so they started to disenfranchise them. And, um, and in many cases, actually, there was violence and murder. And it erupted in total chaos in Louisiana. And, uh, and there, were, there, was, there were massacres. There was blood on the street. There was insurrections. And so it has happened before, and they couldn't figure out who won. This is a governor's race mm -hmm. back then. Um, back then, there was actual fraud. Now there are, I think, mere allegations of widespread fraud without proof of it. But it doesn't change the fact that if people are ginned up by the leaders who are supposed to be um, trying to keep the calm and trying to appeal to the notion of peaceful transition of power, people can easily get ginned up. And that is what happened then, and we saw what happened uh, on January 6, 2021. It was not a day of peace. Nobody with, with eyes or ears thinks that it was a day of peace. Right, right. Um, Dan, I want to talk about <laughs> Pennsylvania. You spent a lot of time there. Obviously, it's the key state. We all believe it's the, the key state that neither candidate really has a extremely plausible pathway to victory without Pennsylvania. I have a specific question, which is how much of this discourse about political violence, about uh, fascism, uh, how much is that affecting the electorate? Uh, and then the more general uh, question has to do with what you've seen and felt on your most recent visit to Pennsylvania. Let me just read something for people at home about your visit. Um, quote, if Trump wins Pennsylvania, it will be because some of his potential supporters who see him as a deeply flawed, uh, do see him as deeply flawed, are more concerned about immigration, inflation, and their negative perceptions of Harris than about Trump's threats of retribution, unstable behavior, and effort to overturn the 2020 election. If Harris wins, it will be because she has fully mobilized suburban women, prevented too many younger voters, particularly black men, from staying home, and rallied those who see a second Trump term as potentially destructive to the future of the country. Um, that's the overall image that you got. Give us a more impressionistic view. So I was there for eight days. I made stops in six different counties uh, along the way. Um, to your first question, I would say that uh, the discussion that we have had at the top of this program is not the discussion that most voters are having in Pennsylvania. Um, certainly there are some who, you know, who are very anti-Trump, uh, who you know, who take all this in, uh, and it adds to the, you know, the... Those are high information. They are very high information. Yeah. yeah. And they're, and they're, you know, they're, they're more liberal and they're solid Harris supporters. Um, I, I, I think that the broader takeaways, uh, as I went through these different stops was I heard more things that should be concerning to Harris and her campaign than I heard it that should be concerning to Trump. Mm. Uh, for example, um, uh, a fellow who runs a tattoo parlor in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, uh, who said, I'm a lifelong Democrat. 
Um, I think, you know, I think Trump incited insurrection on January 6th, but he was never a big fan of Harris and said, I don't know if I'll even vote as a result of that. I went to State College, where Trump is going to be this weekend, uh, to talk to uh, students. And one of the more interesting conversations was with uh, five members of the college Democrats, all working very hard on Harris's behalf, trying to organize everything they're doing. But when we started to talk about her, Gaza came up, uh, and the degree to which they are very unhappy with her positioning on that. They don't think she has been strong enough uh, in breaking away from, from Biden on Israel. Um, uh, I went to Pittsburgh to try to talk to you know, some union workers to get a sense of, of, of the white working class. Um, there's a lot of union workers who are for Harris, but as you get outside of Pittsburgh and some of those other counties, there's less support and there's more support for Trump. In Philadelphia, uh, there is great concern among the people who are trying to get young black voters out to vote that when I was there, which would have been 10 days ago, that the enthusiasm level is not where it needed to be. Doesn't mean it won't be there by election day, but it wasn't. Uh, it was only in uh, Bucks County, which is one of the counties around Philadelphia, the mm -hmm. key suburban counties, when I you know, went to talk mostly with suburban women, where I heard the enthusiasm for Harris, uh, and the passion uh, against Trump. So I take away from that that she has still room that she can grow and she could still get over the top, uh, but she has work left to do. Not to put you on the spot, but let me put you on the spot. <laughs> um, the, the, the feeling you came out with is that it's Trump's to lose as a state. Yeah, that may be a slight overstatement. I came out with the feeling that this is a very, very close election and that things at the margin will determine it and those are, uh, those are almost impossible to be able to tease out, mm -hmm. you know, two or three weeks before the election, right. which is when I was there. Jerusalem, I want to uh, ask you a question, and for fairness, Jerusalem, <laughs> book, just, just, you know, fair and balanced. Yeah. Um, I, and I want to jump off something that, that Dan uh, said. You've written a lot about racial depolarization mm -hmm. um, as a sort of underlying phenomenon that may explain why so many black men and Latino men in particular are open to Trump. Talk about that in the context of these swing states. Sure. So, I mean, it's possible right now, given the polls that we're seeing, especially the New York Times Siena poll, that Trump will perform better than any Republican presidential candidate has with black and Latino voters since the enact, uh, enacting the Civil Rights Act in 1964. So, that's remarkable. I mean, in, at, a, at, a, at a macro level, when you're talking to political scientists, it's exciting for them to see depolarization happening because it means that, you know, both parties are now actually making bids for all people, depend, you know, regardless of their racial background. Um, of course, it's concerning for someone like Harris, who is, is used to counting on that support maintaining. And to put some numbers on it, right, we're talking about pretty significant changes that we're seeing in this polling. Um, Joe Biden in 2020 to Kamala Harris uh, in 2024, we're seeing a drop in 14 points with black voters. And when we look at Hispanic voters, you're seeing a drop in seven points relative to their two campaigns. Harris is still winning those two groups, mm -hmm. um, more so with black voters and with Hispanic voters, as, as is common. But that's still significant. And when you think about it, you know, I think a lot of what, you know, Dan was saying really resonates here. Like other voters, black and Latino voters are thinking um, they have the same top issues. They have issues about inflation. They care about immigration. And so that's really important. And I often hear questions about Hispanic voters, like why aren't they more turned off by his rhetoric? Why aren't they more turned off by the kind of language he's using um, about immigrants? And the New York Times Siena poll has a really interesting finding, which is it asks Hispanic likely voters, do you think he's talking about you? When he makes these sorts of comments about immigrants, is it about you? Only 33% of Hispanic likely voters think he's talking about them at all. They think it's like, oh, it's someone else. It's another group of people that he's referencing. It's illegal immigrants. That's not me. Or if it's them, it's people who aren't working hard. So I think that's really um, right. what's going on here. Um, Dana, in the minute or so that we have left, I, I want to ask you, because I don't think we've had you on since the most important debate in American mm -hmm. history. Uh, that could be discussed, I suppose, whether it's the most important debate or one of the most. But I'm wondering, it's been four months since you co-anchored, co-moderated um, the debate uh, between Joe Biden, then the candidate, uh, and, and Donald Trump. And I'm, I'm wondering, not to put you on the spot again, but um, <laughs> y y what are your dominant impressions of the last 
four months. What's the most surprising thing about the way things went all in of that it. debate? <laughs> That's a great, that's a great I mean, short answer at the end of a show. All, all of, of it. it, yeah. All of it. All of it, really. I mean, just from that moment when the debate began and I was sitting next to Jake and we were watching it and we were thinking, oh, what everybody else was thinking, wow, this was not what we expected. And then everything that has happened since is... Uh, Unexpected. 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 Which, Unexpected. Is, which is why we do what we do. Right? Which is why we do what we yeah. do. Uh, unfortunately, we have to stop doing what we're doing right now. But you can come back next week to see us do it again. Um, we do need to leave it there for now. I want to thank our panelists for, for sharing their reporting and their observations. To our viewers at home, thank you for joining us. Uh, to read all of Anne's articles on Trump's language, please visit theatlantic.com. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan for the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.